So I'm delighted to be here. I think what you're doing uh, in this meeting and in the center in general is very important. And uh, I, uh, you have my application to uh, as a visitor uh, to join this center and uh, trek all the way down here from a town. I think it's uh, I've talked to many of you individually, but I think this is a wonderful intellectual endeavor that we can promote for the for the world. And I think it's NYU. I have to tell you, it's really the way in this respect. Uh, this is the first uh, conference that I attend on the Brain Initiative, which is focused on the repercussions for society, for culture, for uh, sort of intellectual life of mankind. And um, I'm going to be discussing uh, the cerebral cortex. As you know, it's the largest part of our brain in mammals. It covers our ancestors. And uh, we know uh, after 100 years of neurology and a lot of uh, lesion studies in, in uh, experimental animals, that it is the side of uh, all cognitive abilities. All high-level processing in the brain happens in the cortex. It actually is the site of all our mental abilities, and it's also the site of all the mental illnesses. So it generates the mind. It creates what we are. And it's fair to say that we don't understand how it works. And I think uh, we are at the brink of a historical moment in mankind where we're going to be uh, having a scientific understanding of the function of the cortex. And by doing that, we will understand ourselves from the inside for the first time. It's hard to imagine how this would not completely transform our culture, given the fact that we are a, 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 a mind-based and mental species, and that we define ourselves by a mental ability. So, uh, so understanding how the cortex works, to me, is the most important thing that we can do with our lives uh, today. Uh, until a uh, uh, few months ago, I read a paper that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere went above 400 parts per million, which is also uh, a little worrisome. So maybe we should uh, pick up that problem first, <laughs> so that we can figure this one. Uh, so um, what, uh, why don't we not understand what the cortex uh, does? So it turns out that the cortex uh, um, uh, arises relatively recently in evolution and is very similar in different mammalian species. It's a thin layer of, of circuitry, about a millimeter and a half, two millimeters thick. It's about a couple of square meters uh, flat in the human. It's all crumbled up. But it has great resemblances between uh, humans and mice. If you actually dissect it out and cut a little thin strip of cortex, you find that it's built the same way with the same types of neurons, arranging layers. So the hypothesis has been around now uh, for, uh, for more than 100 years because it develops the same way, it looks the same way, it's evolved very quickly in evolution that we're dealing with some sort of modular system. Just like other parts of the body, uh, developmental biology is well known that you build different parts of the body in modules. Uh, uh, evolution likes to work in modules and somehow evolution has figured out a way to compute something with the little module of cortical tissue and is repeating this over and over again by probably duplication of some sort uh, to the point of view or to the point in which in the primates or like ourselves we have as much cortex as we can fit within our, our heads, which is to the size of the limit of the of the pelvis of uh, women. You know? So you can you can imagine that it has to be something really important, very in these uh, strips of circuit. We don't know what it is, but uh, you should also think that different parts of the cortex are involved in completely different computation that apparently have nothing in common. So if it's true that this is a modular circuit, and that this circuit is, is computing some sort of basic function, this function has to be very simple, because it has to be the common denominator of a whole slew of different computations, which in principle, can encompass uh, all kinds of different tasks. So we could be dealing with some sort of biological Turing machine, machine, some sort of circuitry, neural circuit, that evolution has found out that can be used to compute anything that can be computed. And that explains the success of the mammalian lineage and explains the success of our species. No? So this is why I think this is the most important thing to do with about, because we could be in front of us, it is in this stretch of cortical tissue, we could have something that another way to the double kill is in simplicity, that it would have a profound explanatory power 
in terms of uh, computation, uh, uh, cognitive abilities, and of course in terms of understanding our minds. So it's been a hundred years of very smart people throughout the world studying the corpus, generation after generation. Okay, so why can't we figure this out? You could say as a taxpayer. You want the, the, the result. How can we kind of cure schizophrenia? How can we not understand what's autism? Okay, what's going on? So, in general, to summarize it very, very briefly, I would say that the, the paradigm today is that the cortex, like the, best of the, like the rest of the brain, is based on the neuronal doctrine. And this is uh, spearheaded by Kaha more than 100 years ago. The idea that the the unit of structure in the nervous system is individual neuron. And Cajal was an histologist that used this technique called the Goldie's thing that enabled him to stay neurons very uh, thoroughly. And he built uh, essentially catalogs of neurons in different parts of the brain. And he really opened up the field of neuroscience. At the same time, he never was able to deal with the cortex. He considered this his biggest failure. So the neural doctrine is the first thing you learn in neuroscience, and you essentially know that the nervous system is built in the neural neurons, and that's the unit of function. And just like this uh, represented unit of function, there is a physiological neural doctrine that happens actually similar at the same time as Cajal was proposing his anatomical neural doctrine. Sherrington, who is uh, this guy here, argued uh, for a physiological version of the neural doctrine saying that the individual neurons were the unit of function of the nervous system. And uh, Sherrington and people like him afterwards, like Hugh and Whistle, at least the picture of Dr. Hugh Whistle uh, um, in a jocular day, uh, used microelectrodes like this one to record the activity of individual neurons. And through the use of these techniques that stain individual neurons or record the activity of individual neurons, we gain a lot of knowledge about neuroscience, about different parts of the brain. So uh, it's been a fantastic corpus of knowledge, uh, which uh, encompasses uh, hundreds of pages in textbooks now. Uh, so you could argue that neuroscience has not been vital. At the same time, we still don't understand how the cortex works. We don't have a general theory of cortical function or a general theory of brain function. And what's the problem? So if you go out on the street and look out, if you are, uh, imagine, a thought experiment, you're an extraterrestrial scientist, and you see this thing, you say, oh my god, what is this? Let's study its function, let's figure out how it works. And like a good scientist, you go and take it apart, and you figure out that it's built out of atoms, okay? And you try to understand the function of the entire the building by studying the atoms of the bridge, okay? So, it doesn't matter how long you study the atoms, or actively you do that study, you will never get it. And the reason for that is because the function of the the building is an emerging property that arises, of course, out of the structure um, of the atoms, which then build bricks, which then build floor plans. And only when you consider the floor plan, you look at that level, and you understand how the people interact with the floor plan, you will understand what the building means and what the the building does. So now look back um, uh, at, the, at the structure of the brain, the structure of the cortex. This is the primary visual cortex of the mouse. Uh, this is the top, uh, near the, the, the skull, this is the bottom. You're looking probably at about uh, 4,000 neurons. The primary visual cortex of the mouse has 180,000 neurons. Now imagine you were recording from one of these cells and trying to understand what the cortex does. So this is, to me, just like that extraterrestrial scientist looking at the atoms of the parts of the building. You may never get it. Because uh, just like uh, at night when you watch TV and you're watching a movie in the TV, you will not understand the movie if you can only have access to information from a single pixel. So the argument I'm making to you today is that the reason why neuroscience has not uh, come back home with the bacon is because we're dealing with an emergent system. That the brain and the cortex in particular is built precisely to generate emergent states. And that the techniques that we've used have, uh, are shackles that have um, focused our attention on individual neurons, and at the same time, we've missed the bigger picture. We're looking at the TV by looking at single pixels. So, how do you study the emerging properties? Uh, the argument I would make is that you need uh, new techniques. You can try to do it with electrodes, but uh, 
you can pretty much uh, quickly get uh, the idea that this is not going to work. Uh, we're dealing with uh, systems that have hundreds of thousands of millions of neurons. You need a new type of technology. And um, inspired by the Human Genome Project, um, I propose the idea that maybe you should launch a similar scale, large scale project to develop technologies to enable to capture this emergent level of brain function. Uh, and this is a, a, a level that we are ignorant about. So I'm arguing to go and try to see something that we don't know what it is. Okay? So we don't really understand what it is that we're looking for. We're just assuming that it's going to be built out of this emergent level of properties. And I was uh, lucky enough to convince a series of passionate scientists. Uh, uh, interestingly, most of the people that joined this proposal initially, like Paul and Satos, Jan Chan, George Church, uh, Ralph uh, Greenspan, Michael Rokas, uh, uh, these were the original uh, people that uh, joined and with whom I wrote, uh, we wrote this uh, series of white papers. Interestingly, most of them were not uh, neuroscientists, they came from other fields and they thought uh, deeply about emerging properties because it turns out in other fields like in physics, emerging properties are a natural thing. Uh, the fact that you can actually push against the solid and your figure doesn't go through, it's an emerging property of the matter, solidity. We're completely surrounded in the physical world by emerging properties. Somehow, in the biological sciences or neuroscience, we ignore emerging properties that they will never exist. Anyway, the bottom line is that we uh, decided to propose the idea of launching this large scale project that we proposed uh, to call the Brain Activity Map. And as you just heard, we were able to convince uh, the White House to take part on this and, and it. And the goals of this uh, proposal was to measure uh, every action potential from every neuron in a complete neural circuit. So not in the entire brain, but in a piece of the brain of an animal, for example, or a piece of the brain of a human. And the idea that if we capture every action potential from every neuron, we will see the whole screen of that TV, of that brain TV, or at least a piece of a significant piece of the screen to see if there's an emerging property there. Uh, the second goal is to manipulate the activity of these circuits, in other words, to be able to play the piano and alter at will by exciting or inhibiting uh, any neuron in any particular special temporal fashion. And this is critical if we want to test hypotheses about these emerging properties to see whether they matter and what, how they link to mental states of behavior. And the third goal is the computational effort to uh, harness that data, distribute that data freely, and also analyze mining and real models, which are the, what we're looking for. So the idea was to progress just like the human genome, uh, a project that could take a decade or a decade and a half, could be funded at the same rate as the human genome, which was $3 billion of federal funding, start with simple animals like the work, progress our way up to the fly, the fish, the mouse, and eventually learn our tricks to apply this technology to the human. Let me say a little bit more about these, uh, these uh, goals. So goal number one, measure our react, react action potential for every neuron in a complete neural circuit. How can we do it? Well, the different strategies, I'm, going, I'm not going to get into the different strategies that we propose, and you're going to hear some of them through um, uh, the meeting. But let me just give you one example. Uh, this is called calcium imaging. It turns out you can use a calcium indicator to label uh, neurons Systematically, so that you can actually take the first images of entire populations of neurons. Here you're looking at about 500 neurons in the brain of the mouse, primary visual cortex. The neurons are the, are the little gray dots, and they turn red when they're active. And this is about 10 minutes in the life of this mouse. This is on tennis activity without any stimulation. So, using casual imaging, you start to be able to see, uh, I would say, the complete 180,000 neurons of the primary visual cortex of the mouse, but at least you can see these 500 cells. And start to make sense out of that. You, know? uh, you could turn out you can do this in a real animal, in vivo, while the animal is actually awake behaving. You have uh, in the top a uh, mouse that is actually performing a, looking at a visual screen and you just stimulating the visual system with a series of traditional uh, drifting gradients. This is the same type of stimuli that have been used in neurophysiology for 
for years, and then on this uh, low left you have the raw data, how this uh, what looks like, uh, the scalar mm -hmm. reading of the brain of the tissue of the mouth, and the rights of the analysis of this data, so you get a feeling for this, uh, this activity pattern. So something like this is going on in your brains right now. In fact, I would argue that your mind is nothing more than films like this. And the, 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 the challenge for us is to try to decode them and decipher this, uh, this type of data. No? So we need to get the data first. No? I'm showing you data that's from a very, very small number of cells in two dimensions. We need to do it in three dimensions at much faster speed than we need to do it for computing of circuits. So uh, I'm going to make an argument that there are emerging properties to be discovered and uh, using this type of approaches. I'm going to illustrate this with the work of Bill Christen who uh, used a similar technique uh, due to voltage imaging to image the activity of every neuron in a ganglion of a leech. And while the leech was performing a very simple behavior, it was either swimming or crawling, okay? And what he found is that uh, if you look at the activity of all the neurons together and you plot them in a multidimensional space, you can see that the behavior can be tracked down by the dynamical trajectory of the activity of all the neurons. In other words, whether the, the, the animal crawls or, or swims, you can actually see from the activity of the neurons if you consider the population of the neurons. And this is a, an example of an emerging uh, coding for behavior. In this is whether one behavior or the other is coded not just in the activity of the entire population, but on the dynamical trajectory, on the temporal uh, dynamics that these neurons have. This is one example. To bring it closer to home, this is a more recent paper from the, the, uh, the um, lab of the Camp, where you have a mouse uh, which is uh, running a virtual maze and they're performing this to photon calcium imaging from the head of the mouse or the course of the mouse while the animal is making the decision of turning left or right. So they can actually see a piece of the cortex, uh, a few hundred neurons, while the animal is making that decision. And it turns out that just like in the leech, they, if they plot the activity of all the neurons, they can actually, in this multidimensional space, capture the dynamical trajectories that correspond to the animal making one decision, the other decision, or in making errors in the decision. So all of these things you can see, you can decode if you have access to the activity of the entire population of neurons. In this case, it's not the entire population, but it's significant. Uh, a significant number. So these are examples, I would argue, of emerging coding of decision making and of behavior that's already present in the literature. So uh, I take this as examples of the kinds of things that we could find if we were to do this for real and capture the entire activity of the whole neuro, uh, neural circuit. Now, let me just briefly talk how you, one, you uh, could manipulate the activity of every neuron uh, in, a, in, a, in a neural circuit. And uh, you need to use uh, nonlinear uh, optical methods like the photo microscopy. And there's two ways of doing it. You can use optochemistry, which is a way in which chemists can build um, uh, essentially light antennas. In this case, are based on the metal ruthenium. Okay? And these are inspired by the uh, same chemistry that's used to build solar cells. You can attach these light antennas to your transmitter deliver them to the animal, and then with this very strong uh, two-fold laser, you can release the uh, neurotransmitter on top of the neuron, as we do here with the red uh, little dot, and you can make the neuron fire, which is what these uh, traces illustrate. The neuron is firing every time the laser is turned on. And this has single star resolution. That means that you can go neuron by neuron and in three dimensions and turn this neuron on or that neuron on at will using these techniques in a living animal in the cerebral cortex. This is called optochemistry. There's another type of technique, optogenetics. You can do something very similar using genetically encodable uh, uh, molecules that uh, are also light sensitive. In this case, it's a variant of an opsin, a channel of opsin. And here you can uh, look and you can label uh, entire pieces of the cerebral cortex with these genetically encoded uh, indicators. You can make animals transgenic animals that have this in, in, their, in their brains, and then you can go with, with the two-photon lasers, as illustrated in the bottom part of the panel, and you can stimulate neurons that are next to each other, even neurons that are on top of each other. You can stimulate, in this case, the neurons were 20 microns, one on top of the other, and you can stimulate 
the red neuron or the blue neuron. Uh, you can do that simultaneously or stimulate one or the other without any crosstalk. So using this optogenetics and using proof of excitation, you have the ability to essentially turn on neurons uh, at will. You can do this to excite neurons. You can also do this to inhibit neurons with uh, compounds that instead of releasing glutamate, release GABA, or with optogenetic probes that instead of depolarizing, they have to polarize. In this case, we have uh, an experiment that we've done in a mouse, an epileptic mouse, and these are epileptic discharges from the mouse, which, by the way, look just like the epileptic discharges of a human patient. And in this mouse, we've actually applied to the top of the cortex this cage compound that releases GABA, the inhibitor, inhibitor transmitter, and then when we shine light on top of the brain, you can stop the seizures for a few minutes. So this is a hint of what could be the medicine of the future, the neurology of the future, the psychiatry of the future, where we can use these techniques to at will turn on or off particular neurons that are giving us the symptoms. Finally, uh, I would uh, underscore the importance of this computational um, efforts that need to go hand in hand in the uh, creation of tools to take this uh, uh, data. So why would you want to do something as crazy as uh, recording reaction potential from every neuron? There are scientific goals. I would say these are, to me, the most important ones. And the argument I make to you is that this is just an emerging uh, property game, and that neuroscience is at the brink of a change in paradigms, leaving behind the single neuronal doctrine that served well for 100 years, and embracing the population and neural network uh, type of uh, ways of thinking in which uh, the, game, the name of the game is emerging uh, level properties. And we would uh, catch up with our older uh, siblings, physics, chemistry, that have been dealing with emerging uh, properties for now hundreds of years. Uh, this hopefully will let us uh, to answer the question posed by Dean Carew of deciphering the, the neural code, be able to see like in the leech on the mouse, understand how the behavior is originating based on the activity of these neurons, understand what the mind is based on the activity of the neuron, and we may be able to reverse engineer this uh, brain uh, and figure out what is the role of the connections and how these connections lead to the behavior of all the functional states. There are other reasons to do this. I would say uh, a key reason is also a medical reason. I am an MD by training originally. I can tell you that psychiatry and large parts of neurology are in a very poor, uh, sad state of affairs, in spite of the heroic efforts of these doctors, because they don't understand the etiology or the pathophysiology of the, of the disease they're treating. So they're treating them with palliative uh, treatments that don't attack the cause of the symptoms. This happened with schizophrenia, autism, you name it, with very uh, many uh, types of epilepsy. We need to provide these uh, practice of medicine and these patients with uh, better tools to understand the emergent level pathologies that must be occurring in the brain. And uh, tools also to correct these pathologies. And just like we correct and stop seizures in these mice, to be able to stop seizures in human patients using these types of, of tools. Um, other reasons, and these are the ones that were alluded to by President Obama when he embraced this project uh, in the State of the Union address, was economic uh, uh, gain for the nation or for the world. No? The Human Genome Project comes out uh, 15 years later, led to an economic return, which was approximately $140 for every dollar that the federal government spent on it. So it was a gold mine. If you go to places like Palo Alto, you'll see that genomics has eventually revolutionized uh, the bio industry over there. And uh, we can just envision that a similar thing could happen uh, neurotechnology could actually emerge out of the development of this type of, of novel tools. Uh, so that would could be a, a good thing, but of course we'll need to, to wait uh, a decade or so until this materializes and hits the, the economics. No? Uh, other reasons would be to train a new generation of interdisciplinary scientists. This is an interdisciplinary game. These techniques that I'm telling you about are techniques that are not going to come from neuroscience, but going to come from physics, from chemistry. Uh, from uh, computer science, from engineering, even from astronomy, all these other fields have been critical in every one of these examples that we've given you in bringing into neuroscience uh, novel approaches, novel ways of thinking, novel people, and new, new tools. Uh, there's also uh, reasons to do this. There is historical precedent. If we lift our, 
our, our side and look at what happened in the history of science, look at what happened in physics, in chemistry, even in genomics, you can see how this emergent property uh, argument has been successful before and has led to the creation of new uh, sciences that have opened the way uh, knowledge uh, for, for mankind. So uh, the same thing is going on right now in, in genomics, thanks to the human genome project. So I think we, we are in good, uh, in, in good uh, company there. No? Um, just to drive the point home, uh, this is a movie from one of my colleagues, John Donahue, from Brown University, in which uh, we have a patient that's paralyzed, has been paralyzed for 20 years, and she has implanted in her cortex the serial electrode that are connected to the brain computer interface that she's using to move the robotic arm. And by thinking, she's, she's trained this arm to move, and she's going to take a drink for the first time in 20 years from a city car. Okay. This is what we can do today. This woman has only about a dozen of electrodes in there. Imagine what a patient like that could do if instead of a dozen of electrodes, you could actually access the activity of hundreds or thousands of neurons like in the movies that I showed you. We should be able to immediately improve the quality of life of all these patients, so that instead of drinking from a city cup like this, maybe this woman will be able to drive her car or have a relatively normal life. This is, uh, may sound like science fiction, but let me just give you a couple of examples of how this could happen. Uh, right now, the types of data that I showed you these movies are acquired with this type of equipment. We fill a whole room. It's essentially like an optics lab. But you can miniaturize these things using uh, specialized modulator uh, microscopy. And eventually, you can imagine putting them on top of uh, human patients. Um, they can either go through the skull if it's a patient that's undergone neurosurgery or uh, like that, that woman, or even uh, penetrate the skull through uh, some optical developments that are starting to happen now it could accelerate over the next uh, decade or so. Uh, you could do that from the outside, or you could try to image the activity of the human brain from the inside. And let me point out the very creative work that's going on in neuroradiology by using endoscopy to use uh, catheters that are uh, inserted to the femoral arteries. And they can drive up uh, probes like this one, which is about a couple of millimeters long. They call it the extra user. This is the work of Stefan Homling at the Karolinska in Sweden. And they can navigate through the blood uh, arterial side and, and put this probe anywhere they want inside the human brain without any consequences, uh, any side effects. And they can insert this probe, and this probe could be a probe that could have optical uh, properties to image, or electrical properties to record, or to deliver drugs, and they can do that at will today in experimental animals. So you can imagine that maybe the solution may not be to image the activity of the brain from the outside, but maybe to come from the inside. So uh, consequences for, I'm uh, just finishing up, uh, for ethics and for law. Uh, for philosophy, uh, Dean Caru mentioned uh, these issues of privacy. We should be able at some point to read the minds of people if we can have access to that data, just like we're starting to decode the thoughts of these experimental animals. Uh, we should be able to also uh, tell uh, and uh, analyze uh, uh, humans that are in locking uh, syndromes, in coma syndromes, and be able to, to understand and, and really speak with them for the first time and, and understand what they're saying. Uh, this could be a revolution for the legal profession. It could be also have tremendous consequences for philosophy, free will, responsibility. I think uh, we need uh, to incorporate into this effort not just scientists, by like philosophers, ethicists, uh, experts in, in legal matters. And also, I would just echo uh, the uh, proposal of my colleague uh, Phil Kitcher at Columbia that uh, there have to be representatives of the society that are also uh, in these committees that are overseeing the development of this technology. They shouldn't be uh, uh, hidden from the average citizen. The, the, the citizens in, in a free society should have a say in this technology, even though they're not experts. On it. So uh, you may think that this is all crazy, but uh, we've got it all started. Um, we were here initiating the brain activity map. We got help from Stanford Foundation, particularly the Kami Foundation. We passed the ball to President Obama, who then passed it now to NIH and SF DARPA and all the foundations. Uh, 
we are not in charge anymore. We're back to our own apps. We did our job of inspiring, and now we're just down in the trenches working on what we should do to try to improve the technology, not direct these, these programs. There should be other people directing the programs. So I take no responsibility for what's going on now in development. You'll hear a lot uh, about this from Corey Bartman, who will see tomorrow, and she's actually in charge of one of these fans of making the decision. But I can tell you that the ball has started to roll. Uh, we need private foundations, and we hope, uh, we really pray that the industry will get involved. Just to finish, a quote from my mentor, Sidney Brenner, who said that progressive science depends on new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably that order. We <laughs> underestimate the uh, importance of methods, and I hope I have convinced you how the reason that neuroscience are focused on single neurons and single neuronal doctrine has to do with the fact that the methods were single neuronal methods, and that by changing the method, will change the way neuroscience happens. Thank you.